Hello, again, my name is Jamie Schmidt. Um, I am going to be talking content strategy today. Um, content doesn't grow on trees. This little picture, I'm from Portland, Oregon, and this is actually a real tree that's um, on the street in Portland where people write the, all their wishes and they hang it from the tree. Um, if only content were that easy, um, but it's not, and that is why we have content strategy. Um, so I just want to start out by talking about what the talk is and what it's not. Um, it's not a talk that's going to be how you should be writing, uh, or, or you know, you're like a style, you, the style that you should be writing. It's really more of a um, how to get people to start writing and stay on task and make sure that the writing gets done and happens, gets started even. Um, so first, um, I'm just um, the people in the audience who are uh, website developers. Like you build sites for other people and they give you the content. Okay. Okay. And who who are people that write write content like in, and put it up onto a website and you're responsible for writing the content or maybe getting it from someone else or like within your organization? Okay. And um, okay, so I'm not sure who what you other the other third maybe of the room is, but okay. So this talk is kind of directed at. Um, People who have to get content, whether you're a website developer, whether you are within an organization that just created a website and now you need people to all be writing content for it, or you are maybe a blogger and you have to write your own content. Um, yes, so I'm Jamie Schmidt. I'm a WordPress developer, uh, information architecture, I do design still, and I'm a general content enthusiast. Uh, Tech.com. I work, I live in Portland, Oregon. Um, five cats. They are not all mine, unfortunately, but I love them all equally. And they've all contributed to the hair that I've <laughs> been noticing on my sweater. Um, Twitter, I'm at Jamie Schmidt. Um, so, content strategy. Plans for the creation, delivery, governance of useful, usable content. So it's not uh, the type of, it's not how you write it, it's just making sure that everybody's doing what they need to do. Um, everybody's on task, so it answers who, what, where, how, why, when, who's writing the content, what is the content that they're writing, where is the content going to go, um, how, how is it going to be written, and when, when is it due, you know, when uh, is this, this draft due and this draft due. Um, and the reason that this, this is important, content is massive, like content is a huge a huge thing. So you can't have your website without the content. And a lot of times websites get built um, without content. I'm pretty sure we are all very familiar with Lorem Ipsum, um, with just make a space for it, we'll do the content later. It happens so much and, and the poor designers are like, but I need content. And you're like, well, the real content hasn't been written because people are going to be up until 3 o'clock in the morning the night before trying to cram it all into the website. That's that's what happens, and um, so we try to avoid that. Um, obviously, your website website should be built around your content, not the other way around. Um, it's nice to have the content up front. Anybody who's a designer or developer knows that building a website when you have real content is way better than um, trying to enter in content after a website is built because almost never, the content is almost never going to fit into exactly what you've built out. Um, if you don't work together in the beginning. Um, and exactly, you do not want to be the one responsible for making the entire department stay late to enter in content, to write content before the website um, goes live. I have had long nights of entering content, um, going through multiple Word documents, um, different uh, PDFs that maybe are even flattened PDFs where you're hand typing, going through, you know, like a folder of images that are all DSG underscore one, two, two, five, and you're like, I don't know, you know, so like, so that sucks. Like everybody, that, that's like the worst thing. And um, so content strategy is actually much bigger than what I'm going to be covering. So it covers voice and tone, which I'm not going to be covering, but it also, um, creating like a style guide, like that kind of thing, multi-channel consistency. So like maybe you have um, a campaign that is on television, maybe it's on the radio, maybe it's on 
you know, your website. So we want to encourage multi-channel consistency by having all the content and the style like matching up between those. Um, it, uh, communication across the departments, like who's working, where's the content, like who, who owns this. Um, making a content schedule, governance, again, just like who, um, yeah, and having your editorial workflow, like so, okay, so someone writes this content, who is, who approves it, like to go live, like who has to edit it, you know, like that kind of thing. Um, and making sure the content is fresh. So, how does it work? This little um, diagram, I think I grabbed from um, Karen McGrain. I wrote this up. Um, so I'm going to say that it's not necessarily this circle. It's not even necessarily this order, but it is these four things. Um, so yeah, your website is a living, breathing, monstrous, horrible thing that it consumes content. It needs fresh, healthy content to survive, or else you end up in content prison, hell, whatever. Um, and good, good content is an ongoing process of planning your content, creating your content, organizing it, governing who owns this content. Um, so uh, one of the things that um, I'm a big fan of is defining the minimum viable. When you create a website or when you, you're, you decide to create a new website, um, you might not necessarily be prepared for all this new content that you have to write. And also keep in mind that a lot of times the people that have to write this content, they're not necessarily like that's not in their job job description probably like they are maybe, you know, a department head for, you know, some uh, some services or something and now suddenly they have dropped on their plate, oh, you have to write 12 pages of content for this site like. So it can get overwhelming for people. So what we want to do is define the minimum viable content you want to be putting up onto the site, at least letting them know that you know you can write this as a draft first. We just need a draft. We just need an idea of what it is. So um, we want it to be accurate, concise, complete, you know, all those kind of things. Um, so once we have this minimum viable content, we can manage its understand where it's going and you know where it's going to go from here. Um, so the payoff, uh, I've kind of been discussing that, but uh, having accurate content on time in the right formats, like um, in not having everything in flattened PSDs uh, um, or you know, PDFs, whatever, in the right style, um, it can help you streamline your web development process. So one thing that I really like to do as a web developer is I'll create the site architecture, which would be like your posts, your post types, your custom fields, all that kind of thing in the beginning, which you know you should be doing that in the beginning anyway, and then giving the client access to WordPress admin at that point, doing a little bit of a training to show them how to enter their content. So while they're in like on the staging site, development site, entering real content, we can be working on, you know, putting in the plugins and and styling the theme and like that kind of thing. And we have real content constantly coming in instead of, you know, the lorem ipsum that is probably not representative of what's really going to be in there. Um, so, and you find content issues early. Um, if you're missing content, if like some of the content is wrong or, or suddenly who's writing this, like nobody is writing this and we need it early on. So the process, plan. And plan isn't necessarily where you're going to start out. You might already have a bunch of content. So I'm just starting with plan. Um, so you plan out what do you want to say? Um, what content do you already have? What content do you need to create? Um, this can be a big job. Maybe you have a huge website that's um, you know, 10,000 posts or something. Uh, a news site like that is really super overwhelming if you're going to be you know, going over and keeping all that stuff um, uh, up to date. So um, one of the ways that you can do this is mapping up your, out your top uh, when you're first trying to come up with new content. Um, you can map out your contents, uh, what you need and why. What I like to do is a mind map. Um, it's basically like a brainstorm. And this right here is not, this, is, this was made by um, a mind map generator online service. Honestly, I would use paper and pencil. Um, because you don't want to have to worry about the drop shadow on a box when you're just brainstorming. Like, honestly, I just like say, it. just write it on paper. Um, so, and then really, it's like so. Maybe this would be, you know, our products, and then we have this product here, and like, okay, yeah. So then we need 
pictures here and we need to have, you know, so like think of absolutely every content you need on your site. Maybe the center is homepage, maybe the center, you know, whatever section. And don't worry, this is not a deliverable. Don't worry about what it looks like. It's really to get you thinking about what you all need. And you're going to realize that this thing is going to get bigger different things. Um, and it's also gets, uh, it's helpful to have this for later on when you are mapping out your content types. Um, so sourcing your content, where does it come from? Uh, you're not necessarily going to have your entire department writing the content. Like maybe you have some third party content. Maybe you have content that's been in print brochures. Um, uh, you know, maybe you're going to be hiring someone to write the content. Maybe you're you know, licensed content, whatever it is. So you figure out where you're going to get this content from. Um, and then content style guide, which is actually, as far as I'm going to go uh, into writing the content yourself, a guide for your content creators to stay on track so that everybody is writing their content in a similar um, tone and voice and they have um, like a, a, a similar, so everybody uh, is writing with the same, in the same style, I guess. Um, so one example of this is MailChimp. MailChimp has an amazing style guide. And if you look on my slides, that's actually clickable, so you can go there. Um, this entire section, like this entire thing is their style guide. So they have a section that covers voice and tone. Like if you're writing some copy for MailChimp, make sure that you are friendly. You're saying something in a friendly way instead of, good evening, madame. You know, like we don't want to talk that way in MailChimp. We're friendly, we're accessible. Um, so it talks about grammar, like the word and phrase bank, which is like uh, MailChimp has certain phrases that they consistently use across uh, all of their web properties. And you want to use the right words, you know, writing for the blog. Maybe you, you have a different voice style when you're writing for the blog compared to uh, the website. So that's super awesome to have something like that. Um, so then organize is another section. So here you look at Okay, what do you have? What content do you already have? So if you're doing a site redesign, you're um, maybe adding another section to your site, you want to see what you have. And then once you know what you have, you want to look at what do you need next. Um, and then obviously, where will you get it from? Um, so one way to do this is a content inventory. It's nothing beautiful, pretty. It's not, you don't have to style it. It's basically just spread, looks kind of like that. Um, you add anything to it that you want, um, but it documents all the content that you have on your website and across all your websites. So it, it, it will uh, show what you have. So maybe you have a bunch of stuff in print. On your website, you have like maybe 20 pages. Um, there's a lot of uh, templates and that you can download for content inventories. Um, and basically, you just go through and you look at what is the format this is in? Where is it? Who's the owner? Like, who's writing this content? Like, maybe somebody has this content um, on their hard drive somewhere, and that's you need to know where that is, the length, like, what's the topic, that kind of thing. Um, and then once you've done that, now you know what you have, and you're, like, you know, really comfortable and familiar with your content. Now you're going to do the content audit and the analysis. Um, so this is where you are looking at what do I need? So we basically you start like a little bit of a process here. You find the ROT, R-O-T, uh, which is the redundant, outdated, trivial, like, okay, we don't need this. This is old. We need to get rid of this. Um, what needs to be revised? Like maybe you have a different tone that you're using now um, and it needs to be written in a new way. You find what can be shared. What can be shared? It's like, what can be shared across um, your website? What can be shared across all of your different um, channels? that you're uh, communicating in. So uh, I'm not sure if anybody is familiar with the NPR COPE. Um, it's create once, publish everywhere. They created an amazing series, bunch of APIs so that they people only write in their content in one place and they're using that exact block of content to push it out to all their different websites and all their different APIs. And that's what we want to do. We don't want to write duplicate content because that's stupid and you know, You'll be maintaining content in a bunch of different areas. You'll forget that this is over here. Just write it once. And then uh, you do your, we call it a gap analysis, content gap analysis. But really, it's just once you've done all that, you're like, OK, well, we have all this. What about this entire section? Apparently, we have nothing here. So that's when you, you, know, you write down everything that you need for that. And you're like, OK, this is the new content that we need. Um, so you find out what 
have um, in-house distribution, an existing website, mobile, whatever, and um, kind of try to account for that. Um, governance. So this is how we find out who is going to be writing the content, who is going to take ownership of this content. Um, no idea that they're suddenly the owner of this department of content. Um, but you need to go through and you need to figure out who's going to be writing what. And you need to tell them. Um, and you need to define their roles. So is this person maybe they can write, but they can't publish? Or maybe they can, um, they can just edit other people's content? So this is an opportunity for you to give people different roles. And when you assign roles like this, you're taking the burden off of just the one person. So you're kind of distributing it across a couple different people. Obviously, if it's your own website and it's your own content, that's all on you. Um, <laughs> but um, so assigning the ownership. So, yeah, ownership and roles. So like maybe you have someone that's a web manager, editor, content creator, um, someone sourcing the content, somebody that goes through and um, checks it for SEO keywords and, and SEO writing. Um, so there's lots of different roles that you can do, and these roles actually kind of coincide, can coincide with um, WordPress um, roles. So um, an important part of content strategy is the editorial calendar. So in the print and publishing industry, ever since the dawn of newspapers, maybe not, um, they've been using editorial calendars. That's how newspapers figure out what is going to, what content's going to be going on what spot on the site, like what content is written. Um, and there's no reason that we can't use this exact same thing for web development um, because it works. And it's basically um, figuring out a calendar. You can use this as an ongoing process. Like if you're a blogger and you want to stay on track and you want to remember, oh, okay, so I'm going to be writing two blog posts this week. And it's really easy to like let that go and forget about it and maybe leave it to the end of the week and sort of like, oh no, I have to write two now. This isn't good because like two posts at the same time, they're not going to get you know the same attention. Um, so writing up this calendar can really help you like map out your topic. Maybe you map out all your topics like a month ahead of time. You write all your topics, you just put them on the calendar like, okay, here I start this one and here I, I finish it, here I publish it. Um, so for like someone who's a single blogger, like that's amazing. But we can also use this um, if you're an agency and you're trying to get content, or if you are in-house and you are getting your content together and you want everybody um, to be doing their part. So there's a couple of plugins for WordPress. You don't have to use a plugin for it, but you can. So there's a couple of plugins. One is EditFlow, Editorial Calendar. There's like four or five or six of them that you can pick from. Well, you can use Google Calendar too, of course. And so basically it's like, okay, um, you put the calendar and so maybe you have like five people that are responsible for content. You're sharing a calendar between everybody. So now they know, oh, okay, Monday, my first draft of this page is due. My first draft of the homepage content is due. And then on Wednesday, oh, she's gonna be editing it and, and telling me if it's good. And then, okay, so Friday, the final draft is due. And you can spread this over months. Because sometimes websites, you know, they months to, to, you know, to get going. And as long as you start with the draft, which is the, the minimum viable content, and you get that draft up in the WordPress and, and you're um, able to build that into the site, like that's a, already a really good start for you. So um, having the calendar keeps everybody on the same page um, and keeps everybody, it, it, it distributes the burden so that you don't sit there at the last minute and have to write 10 pages of content. Um, another thing that you can do uh, is defining your CMS roles. Uh, so who needs access to WordPress? Um, uh, who are, are they uh, going to be also managing the store? Are they going to be just writing blog posts? So um, there's plugins that extend the functionality of WordPress um, roles. Um, apart from the existing ones, and you just ask these questions like, okay, so we're giving Judy access to um, create edit pages, but can she also create new ones? Oh no, she can't create new ones because she doesn't actually know what our strategy is for the website. You know, um, can editors approve content across the entire site or just their own sections? So like, once you think of these things, once you start thinking of them, you're like, oh yeah, no, I don't want 
in, you know, the, the store, like I don't want her to accidentally delete something. I just want her to have access to the, to the blog. So figuring out this can save you a lot of headache in the future because uh, you will have less broken site and less content that you're like, where did this come from? Who wrote this? Yeah, so. And then create, creating the content. It also applies to creating the CMS architecture. Oh, content management system, which is what WordPress is. Yes. So CMS architecture is when you are building your website, um, you're going to have different content types, posts, pages, media. Um, and uh, so that all has to be planned out because typically you're not necessarily going to be just using the editor. Maybe you have a bunch of custom fields. Maybe you have a custom post type. Um, so this little flowchart is also by Karen McGregor, I think, and um, it kind of goes through the governance and the content creation flow that you could possibly have in a, a company. Like, so somebody decides, okay, we need this content written, and then someone, okay, well, who's gonna write this? Business partner review, who's like, yes, okay, write the creation, content creation, does, does a person even have enough information to start creating the content? No? Okay, find the missing information. Yes, then somebody writes it, and uh, it gets approved by who? Does it get? No, what if it doesn't get approved? Then it goes back to this person, and it goes through like this whole... I mean, it can. Of course, if you were, you're writing a blog and you're approving your own content, you just say, yeah, this is awesome. Um, but sometimes, sometimes, Sometimes other people are telling you, no, it's not awesome. It has to be rewritten. So, um, so content modeling is actually like content model. I'm not going to go into it because it's more of um, it's a very big, uh, in-depth topic. Um, I did a talk on it at WordPress Columbus. Um, my slides are up there. Um, uh, but it's basically you discover and plan your metadata. Metadata would be you have a post, any extra information attached to that post. Uh, your content types, taxonomies, so um, it would be like your categories, your post categories. Like it's good to have that planned out ahead of time. If you have a product, a site with products, like okay, well, what are, are my products in different categories, or are they just in one, you know, one big? Um, so planning all this out, which is what we call uh, the site architecture, and building this in to the site right away uh, as a developer is what can get you started on getting your content creators to be able to put the content in right away. And that helps you immensely as a, design, a developer. Um, so the CMS task audit. This is um, basically what steps are involved in each process. So like somebody has to add a new product so you go through and you look at, okay, what tasks, what's all involved? So they need text, photos, do we have a video of it? Does it have like a Twitter feed? Like are we adding like a new Twitter for it? Um, what goes in the sidebar? Does the person have access to the sidebar? Um, is there a form that they need to create? Is some, you know, do you need to be uploading things? Um, so once you go through that, you can realize like, oh, well, my person that's writing this doesn't actually have access to the media library, but she needs to upload and edit photos. We have to make sure we give her access to that. Um, and there will be a lot more. You're going to find them. And it's also good um, for training because you realize, oh, so yeah, so our, one of our content editors has been doing blogging the whole time, but they've never actually um, maintained a form, you know, maybe, uh, or whatever, added a new product. So like then you're like, okay, we need to train them person to do this. Um, so there's a lot more uh, to content strategy than that. I just picked out a couple things that are helpful to um, the typical, an agency or uh, a, a company that wants to get their content more on track. Um, but implementing content strategy in your organization can be really beneficial. Even if you're a development agency, you don't write content, you can still offer it as a service. Maybe your client doesn't know anything about writing content. Like they're not writers. They are just a company that maybe makes windows and they want a website. So being able to guide them along this road is going to make things a lot easier.
It's going to make things a lot easier for them. So just having those soft skills as an agency or as a person that writes content can help you immensely. Um, you can add it on to your existing processes, like say maybe the content strategy is part of the discovery uh, process. Maybe it's you know project management. Like you, you can figure out where you can work these little bits in. Like maybe at this point we create the editorial calendar. We make sure that that everybody knows what's going on at this point. Um, or you can offer it as a new service that is a paid service on top of what you're already offering. So maybe you are charging extra for like an in-depth discovery process or maybe you have like an SEO process. So you can add content strategy and you can really um, make the case for content strategy because they don't necessarily know what lies ahead of them for the, you know, the big content, massive content ball that is about to be thrown on top of them. Um, so it, it really benefits everybody as um, a content creator or uh, an agency, knowing about these things, knowing what lies ahead is going to be difficult to manage. Um, and being sort of aware of what's all coming down the pipeline just really helps everyone out. Um, but bite off only what you can chew. Um, the things that I described, like I kind of brought up a bunch of different topics here that uh, you can use. You don't necessarily need everyone. Like, of course, if you're a blogger, maybe just editorial calendar is good for you. Um, if you're a small agency, maybe um, just assigning, you know, different governance, you know, to different people is all you need. If it's a big project, obviously, something like this is kind of important. Like, you want to do as much organization with it as you can. But, um, you can end up at a point where you have so much organization, you're like, okay, when do I even start writing the content? It's kind of like that um, Zeno's paradox where you're like, oh, before he takes one step first, he has to take half of a step. Before he takes half a step, he has to take a quarter step. You can keep making it so complex that you're just like, I just want to write. Mm -hmm. So um, definitely pick and choose what you think is going to help you. If you try something out, it's like, okay, this wasn't helpful at all to us. You don't need to make it in the future. Um, so that is pretty much it. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and my questions. Yeah, yes. Where can we learn more about content strategy? Okay, so yes, where can we learn more about content strategy? Um, there are a lot of super great resources, and I was going to add them to the end of this, and I didn't. Um, there is a bunch of super great people that are in the content strategy industry. Karen McGrain is one. Um, uh, K-A-R-E-N-M-C-G-R-A-N-E. Um, Christina Halverson. Um, there are lots of books. There's content strategy for the web. There called Intertwingled that's um, been super awesome that I've been reading lately. Um, there is a website called Gather Content. Um, Gather Content is actually a super cool resource that it, um, it's a software as a service where you, where you uh, content types within Gather Content and you have your um, content creators uploading content through there. And then, so now you're getting your content as text rather than you're getting, you know, a bunch of Word documents that are probably formatted. So that's how you, you know, you're kind of able to strip out content that way. So they have a really super great blog. It's like .gathercontent.com or something like that. Um, but yes, lots of books, um, content strategy for the web, um, basics, there's like content. There's at least four books that um, are super good. So just do like a search for content strategy, you're going to find there's a, a really good list of part article that you can look on. Um, Clive Gibbon is he's a, a content strategist from the UK. He, if you're more interested in content modeling, which is uh, figuring out your content architecture process, which is creating your taxonomies, um, your post types, he has an awesome web series that he wrote up that I highly recommend. Says okay. uh, Clive Gibbon, C L I V E G I B B O N. B, B, B. Yep. Is there any sort of consensus on how often we should be uploading new content in order to keep Google happy? So, 
about a consensus on uploading new content in order to keep Google happy. Um, having a website that you don't have to have every single page be completely fresh every single week. Um, what Google does is it indexes all of your sites and it's like, oh, nothing on this site has been updated since 2009. Like it, it looks at it, but then, uh, you know, it goes through another site. It's like, oh, this has got fresh content that was just uploaded on October 2nd, you know, October 1st. Um, so you don't have to be updating every part of your website, just the parts that, you know, keeping them fresh. So, uh, as, you know, that's more of an SEO question. I don't have SEO statistics for that, but um, keeping bits of it updated is much better than none of it. And you definitely don't need to keep updating every single page of your site all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, just talking about content architecture, mm -hmm. say if you have, I'm a blogger. Yeah. So say travel blogger so so four different types and sure. they all kind of lead into one like main travel landing page mm -hmm. do you link across the streams because i've read you should just link up i've read you should just link down is this a seo question um it's just a content architect i just want to know how do you okay organize sure so it? she is asking if you're um a blogger and you have like maybe four different blog topics that you talk about and they all kind of converge together in under one sort of main topic. Um, that is one that you would want to consider there is, is there ever a time when you want to list all of these out together? That means, yes, you do need a relationship right there. So then you would be doing as blogging, you know, that's your categories, you know, or it can be your tags. You kind of decide which, you know, which way you want to do that. Um, and just whatever, if depending on uh, there's different plugins like do post to post if sometimes you maybe want to refer to another post that's in you know within it, uh, your topic you can use different plugins that create this relationship natively or you can just link to them um, obviously like you know having it in the sidebar is really helpful um, but as far as blogging that's what categories are made for um, so keeping all of your stuff on one topic in one category, the next in one category, they're all part of the blog, which is the blog is like the overlying um, umbrella that keeps all the, those together and so related. You make so it's, two categories. You can, if, if you wanted to use multiple categories, if you want that blog post to show up, um, I mean, sometimes it might be, I would say that maybe that might be a better case for tagging um, because typically, when you're going through a category feed, um, it really depends, honestly, it really depends on what your content is. Um, tagging is what we call a folksonomy in the information architecture speak, um, and it kind of means it's, it's a, um, a sort of uh, taxonomy where you're giving the person the ability to add as many um, extra bits of metadata to that as they want. So like maybe you're blogging about dogs and walking in the park and New York. So if you ever wanted to just list all of your posts on New York, then that's a great, you know, argument for a tag. But you don't necessarily want an entire blog section on your site that's called New York because that's not what you blog about, you know. So I would maybe use tags for that um, while keeping them within their main category. Um, but it really de depends on how you want to display it all. But does WordPress allow you to have uh, one article in several categories? I don't think so. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so he asked if WordPress um, allows you to have one article in several categories. It definitely does. You can put in as many categories as you want, um, but keep in mind that if people are going through your different categories, they might be seeing a bunch of content more than once, and they'll be like, hey, do you even write anything else? This is, this is the top story in every single, con every single um, category I'm going to, you know. So that's like sometimes tagging comes in a little bit more useful there. Any other questions? Yeah. One, question. oh. <clears throat> um, one second. Oh. Uh, just a comment on the uh, category versus tag. Yeah. I learned it in the way I think of uh, categories is the uh, table of contents of a book. 
and the uh, tags are the index. From yes. The so that's been very helpful yes, that's that's a great that's a great point. Um, so she learned in another WordCamp that um, when you're trying to decide bef between um, categories and tags, think of the categories as your um, table of contents of a book. When you first open the pages, you see this, and think of the tags as the back index where you're searching for, um, you know, different things that might have been mentioned that you don't necessarily have, there's, have you know, a whole section of your book dedicated to. So, yeah, what was yeah, your saying? Just uh, going back to what you said during your presentation, you said uh, writing once and publish yeah. to multiple channels or yeah. different platforms. Yep. Does that uh, create duplicate content on these different channels? So he's asking, um, when I was talking about the Create Ones Publish Everywhere, does it create duplicate content on these different channels? It can, um, but typically, no. Like, typically you would want to um, just be displaying the content that's all originating from the WordPress site, which is so WordPress has, you know, the, we're, you know an API that you can use to, to publish all your content out in. Maybe you have, like, a Drupal site. Maybe you have like another WordPress site. Maybe you have another site that just shows all of your news or whatever. They are all kind of pulling that exact same post. So ideally, you don't want to duplicate it because yeah. then that's two things. But if it's all pulling from the same one place, you've only written it in one place, it's ideal to have it structured in a way that you can push it out to here. Maybe it's going to be styled differently on this website, so you don't want to have um, certain styles attached to it. Maybe it's, you know, whatever. So um, that's an argument for structured content right there. And um, I'm a huge proponent for structured content. That's a whole other talk, though. Um, but uh, yes, ideally, you don't want to duplicate it. Yeah. But sometimes you have to, obviously, if you're, push if you're using print, you know, or if it's going on, someone's saying it on the radio. You know, you maybe you're gonna print it out, like. But ideally, you don't duplicate it in your CMS. My main concern is, would you be penalized by Google because if they crawl different sites, it's the same content, and uh, the one you really want to rank higher actually got, uh, got right. penalized. Right. Well, so the main site that this topic is your main topic, you probably have different markup for it. Um, it's probably in a completely different context. So you're syndicated on another site, maybe that site is just, maybe it's just part of a bullet list, you know, a, um, a bullet list of links that maybe link back to your site. Or maybe it's just being shown in, you know, just like a really small area. Um, you know, so there's different ways that, you know, obviously it's yeah. uh, not gonna hurt you. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to comment on that, that, uh, um, for example, on WordPress.com, publicize feature where when you write a post, um, it'll, it'll share that post to, you know, Facebook, Twitter, mm -hmm. wherever, wherever you're connected, but it's just going to be a snippet of the post. Right. So, you, so that way you are sharing it in other areas, but you're not risking it duplicate. Oh, okay. Yep. So he said um, on WordPress.com it has, um, a, you can publish, uh, you can, when you publish a post, you can publish it out to Twitter and Facebook and it just gives you a snippet and a link back. Right. So it's not actually showing your entire post and that's, you know, definitely a great example of your ex using the, ep the excerpt field on your posts because maybe that excerpt is all you're going to be showing on the different. Um, yeah, in the back. Oh, sure. Your, uh, mm -hmm. uh, media. Yeah. So he said that there's a, a plugin for WordPress.org that is your self hosted WordPress site. Um. <laughs> Sorry, <my reading. laughs> Add some festivity to this talk. Um, he was saying that there's different plugins um, that allow you to share your content out. So um, he says Shareaholic, Share This is another one. I think Add to This is another one. Um, it automatically creates the little Facebook links and everything at the bottom of your post so that. Yeah, people can share it. Yeah. And um, it, there are also plugins that allow you to 
push it right out to Twitter too when you post. Um, that's uh, a whole another topic of getting that stuff out there though too. So, any anything else? Yeah. <coughs> Google hates content that's ever spam blocks. For any of you that are, that are not from Canada, Canada's a bilingual country, the government's, <coughs> the government's website is canada.gc.ca slash en or slash fr in English, French, everything on the English. So when you do uh, a website with the like a travel site, government of Canada, there's a few countries for, right. for like Switzerland has four languages, so they have four. Is that going to be looked as, even though it's the same content, as yeah, that's a good question. Um, so he asked, um, and a multilingual sites where you have basically four different websites, one's English, one's German, one's French. Um, he's asking if Google penalizes you for having that duplicate content. Um, I'm not SEO expert, if anybody in the room has a comment on this, um, but Google does recognize languages, and Google is smart, and Google doesn't think that you are trying to spam you know, the um, internet with all your different languages. Did you have a comment yeah, on that? Um, so up in the code of a page, it will say like slash en slash French. So in the back end source code, it will actually differentiate the languages, which will tell Google it's a different language. Um, and as far as uh, like duplicate content, if you ever have to actually duplicate the, the blog page somewhere else, like I, I work for a company that has three websites and we we take the news items from the first one and, and publish them on the second one. And you can actually put like a canonical tag mm -hmm. at the top that says my preferred version ranked this one and then the other ones won't be ranked and then you're not penalized for it. Yep, so um, one thing was uh, using canonical tags uh, on your uh, content that say this is not the preferred version, the preferred version is, you know, this is the preferred version, is um, to make sure that Google, as to your question, um, is not thinking that you have just like 12 different versions and you're trying to spam everything. So that's, that's a great top. What? Canonical. It's a um, HTML tag. It's a... Um, way of adding a little bit extra markup metadata to your content that tells Google certain things, like certain things that you only want Google to know, you know, for example. Um, and you also, yeah, none, if you're using your content in different places, so, so your second, say you have a site that you're pushing this out on. In the, in the, template file when you're writing the HTML so maybe you're putting this inside of a div and like a p tag you can write you can put this canonical tag in there that shows that yes I do know that this is published elsewhere this is secondary importance to what's the main one and then on the main one you say this is the main one right so yeah yes that was great Right. Is that something that you should do then if you have, um, if you're a blog writer and somebody says, hey, can I repost this article on our website, then you should post this on your own page to say, like, this is where it was written through? Um, it depends. You're, you're not going to be able to, I mean, they can pull it in with an iframe, but if you don't have, like, an API set up, or they can pull it in through RSS, of course. But those are all kind of manual ways that you're not necessarily going to have your blog set up to be doing. Um, so. If it's all also posted on and they ask you, is that what you're saying? They ask you if they can also copy it? Like, yeah, like they want to just pick, basically post the article that I just wrote onto their own website. Right, so that would be an example of using the canonical maybe if, um, I don't know how you'd be able to, if it's a blogger, they might not be able to add that. Yeah, because you could Of course, right, uh, linking it to your site. Yes, you would definitely want them to link to your site. It, um, if they're adding the right, the right kind of metadata, yeah. And you know what? I'm actually very interested because there, um, if there's a WordPress plugin for this kind of thing, and I, I don't know if anybody has seen one, that might be a good idea if there's any plugin developers out there. Plugin Yeah, to show like this is this content originated, you know, from this other site, and that would be something that you would, you know, describe in the code. Was there any more questions? Yeah, okay. Thank you very much.